Thank you, Jason. You're definitely a proof. Oops. Proof that an image speaks louder than words. Wait a second. I'm having a. So thank you very much for that. And Jason is a high school teacher. So he has, it's very important our teachers have an amazing ability to be able to transfer knowledge and, aware, and awareness. So then we can create further change for our youth. So thank you very much for that. It's very important. Our next artist is Latai. Very colourful. She's a performance installation artist and her works impact on climate change. Three beliefs that she think would, would, thinks that would save the world, and I'm sure many people in this room would agree. Abolish the use of fossil fuels. Distribute economics more equally. Get the advantage to switch places with the disadvantage. Can you imagine some of the politicians oh, going to a remote community and staying there for two weeks? Not three days, two weeks. How amazing. And so that's a very good thought. So I just want to also confirm that these are synthetic. <laughs> these are not real feathers. This is for my children, because they don't like me to do the wrong thing. So welcome to the stage, Latai. Thank you. Latai Taumai Piao is a punake, a body-centred performance artist. Her story is of her homelands, the island Kingdom of Tonga, and her birthplace, the Eora Nation, Sydney, and everything far and in between. She mimicked, trained, and unlearned dance in multiple institutions of knowledge, starting with her village, a suburban church hall, nightclubs, and a university. Latai activates indigenous philosophies and methodologies, cross-pollinating ancient practices of ceremony with her contemporary processes and performance work to reinterpret, regenerate, and extend her movement practice and its function in and from Oceania. She engages in the socio-political landscape of Australia with sensibilities in race, class, and the female body politic committed to bringing the voice of marginalised communities to the frangy penniless foreground. Latai also wakes, works for Playwriting Australia, facilitating an, an introduction and intermediate playwriting workshop program to communities and schools of culturally and linguistically diverse communities. She is also the project's worker with Radio Skid Row, a community radio station in the inner west of Sydney, engaging with communities in creative digital media projects that are underrepresented in mainstream media. In 2007, I was fortunate to accompany a group of Pacific people from across the Torres Strait Islands, Melanesia, Polynesia and Micronesia to the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Bali. It was 10 days after Kevin Rudd became Prime Minister and his government ratified the Kyoto Protocol. We attended all the plenary sessions and held our own side events with the message that Australia's nearest neighbours were in serious danger of becoming submerged due to being low-lying islands. As the week progressed, we met more and more people from vulnerable nations, such as the Inuit people, Bangladeshi people, Maasai people of Kenya, and of course the host Indonesian people. I became familiar with organisations such as Many Strong Voices, Alliance of Small Island States, Small Island Developing States and many more. The reality of the existing impacts of climate change on many developing nations was overwhelming, but I discovered very quickly that this was not only an environmental issue, but a human justice issue. Many impacted nations had contributed nothing to accelerated human-induced climate change, but were clearly on the front line of contaminated water tables, rising sea levels, king tides, hurricanes, extreme weather changes, drought and dispossession. When I returned to Australia, I was invited to speak at many environmental NGO platforms about the Pacific, which started to feel tokenistic and irrelevant to the voices I was advocating on behalf of. I started to investigate ideas around our responsibility as Australians around industrialisation and carbon emissions. I got caught up in the study of climate science and economics, which became so depressing in comparison to the proactive Pacific who were already implementing clean resources and adaptation programs. 
I heard from my friends whom I travelled with to the UN climate change conference, Ursula, and environmental ac activists from the Carteret Islands who told me they had to relocate to Buka in Bougainville because king tides had cut their island into two pieces, despite their efforts of building sandbag walls and that their food gardens were also contaminated by salt water rising up into the water table. They were waiting for rice and water drop-offs every month, which didn't arrive. So the matrilineal women of the Carterets tirelessly made garlands of shell money, a local currency, in exchange for land from women on the main island, rather than church-owned land. This really hurt my heart, and I decided to spend my time creating artistic campaigns that may evoke a human response to action to make changes that we're, that we're going to benefit vulnerable communities. I hope that my campaigns could exist alongside the environmental campaigns of Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth. So I started doing artist residencies at the performance space, uh, University of New South Wales, Critical Path and Bundanon. I was eventually commissioned by the MCA to present a performance installation work titled Island Exile. I bound and suspended my body under two tons of ice for one hour durations on and off throughout the season. Through my practice-based research, I was compelled to explore the complacency and privilege of ordinary citizens. I considered and created imagery based on the psychological and physical experience of water torture and Tongan metaphors of being bound to land, as well as the literal accelerated melting ice glaciers in the Arctic, um, causing sea levels to rise on low-lying islands. This video is from a remount of Island Exile at Campbelltown Arts Centre in 2012 for the Toward the Morning Sun exhibition. I repeated a live durational performance of Island Exile and created a two-channel video installation for the exhibition. I'm now going to read a commissioned written response to the first installation at the MCA, which my sister wrote. It felt like a funeral. Sad, haunting, disturbing, just sad. I knew what was coming. I was aware of the topic, the issues, the thinking and planning behind it all. I thought I knew what to expect, but I don't think I was prepared for the feelings or the sombre mood, the dripping depression, the incessant cold. Even now, it hurts me to remember. Like a Green Beret paratrooper on an obligation, Kavenga mission, I dropped into the MCA site to support my big sister's artwork, Island Exile. Trained but sadly underprepared for the reality. Nothing prepares you to witness your family or your kin in the throes of a painful experience. It seemed to never end. I must admit, it did look beautifully stoic, substantially stark, a real spectacle. Passers-by milled around with a sense of waiting. We were all so silent, engrossed together as strangers in this unifying silence, collective uncertainty and waiting. I knew some of the crowd, but I felt estranged. No matter who, it was hard to know what to do, what to say, how to interact with my sister, with each other, with the issues, the discomfort, the cold, with feeling hungry or wanting to go to the toilet or wanting to help or to try to end it, just so damn uncomfortable. My sister was obviously freezing cold, tired, spent and tortured, so it felt stupid to complain about my own discomfort. Her teeth chattered sometimes and she would stretch and shift her body from the lashing pressure of the ropes holding her in place, suspended under the melting ice. Her eyes were teary. She never really cries, this lady, but she did, a, she did on those days. Maybe this is why she did this to us, so we can cry. Our peoples know what to do ritualistically with death and natural disasters, but long-awaited human manufactured disasters, what to do? She looked me dead in the eyes and cried out to me when she saw me arrive. Well, it was more like a pathetic sob, and I thanked God that my mother and brother could not make it there to experience this burden. It hurts someone deep inside to feel useless, not really paralyzed because you can move, not really silenced because you can make noise. Even though it was only she who was rope bound to the dripping ice blocks being whipped by freezing wind, somehow, all us witnesses became suspended for the duration, not knowing what to do or say. How could I just stand by and watch it? I could, I did, 
and we all do, all the time. People we know from our region are in the process of becoming dispossessed due to climate change, melting polar ice caps and rising sea levels. It is a form of water torture waiting for it to happen and it all feels like a long and relentless funeral. Sad, haunting, disturbing, just sadly inevitable. Earlier this year, I was commissioned as artistic provocateur to make a performative response to the Blacktown Pacific community and performance space in a visual arts and performance season titled Stitching Up the Sea. The theatre is a renovated church which made me consider cultural performance spaces which in Tongan are called mala'e. They are wide, open, outdoor sites. They are ceremonial grounds or burial sites or even sporting sites. I explored the function of collective dances, which are oral historical markers of time and space. I wondered what my dance would be about. Of course, it's about climate change, but what about it? Many reports of Kiribati purchasing land from Fiji for agricultural purposes had come out, and later Fiji extending an invitation to accommodate a whole nation of emigrants from the Oceanian neighborhood. This highlighted one of the greatest resources Pacific people have, and that is our ancient relationships of obligation with each other, considered more valuable than gold, oil, and money. I invited my male mothers, who are also artists, to collaborate with me in a durational performance also titled Stitching Up the Sea. Using a club usually used to beat mulberry bark into large ceremonial cloth called tapa ungatu, we smashed wine and beer bottles collected from the workers' club next door in Blacktown. We spent an hour crushing the glass material into small bits with our clubs and feet bound in bricks. Maybe we were making sand. Maybe we were rebuilding our ancestral land. It was exhausting, dangerous, and nearly got stopped by the curator. If only this type of intervention could come from the largest developing, developed island in the Pacific. Last week I returned from a performance space artist laboratory called Time Space Place Nomad. 30 artists from various disciplines camped together in regional New South Wales at various locations and found some wonderful collaborative methods. I managed to experiment with some options like the inflatable moon head and projections that I worked in earlier. And when we were in Narandra, I learnt of Yenda, a small community there that were evacuated due to flooding in March earlier this year. They are not considered a flood zone, and so they had no evacuation procedure and they had no insurance. There's been a cover-up, bureaucracy and many homeless people still waiting to be housed. This encouraged me to create the Exodus experiment. I conducted my own evacuation procedure on the campus with many tasks and processes for the artist to comply with. I filmed this with a drone camera and this will be informing my next few works. I am concerned that international law has not caught up to climate change issues as environmental displacees are not considered asylum seekers or refugees they are not fleeing persecution and they are not running away from religious warfare. So I have many questions around where will the people who choose not to abandon their ancestral homes go? Who will take responsibility for the climate debt? I wonder what rights do people have without land? I wonder what happens to international water borders without land? What does this mean in terms of fishing licences? Why is Australia encouraging the Pacific nations to commit to deep sea mining of the ocean bed? Arriving back in Sydney just in time to participate in the Climate Warrior coal mining blockade in Newcastle, the largest coal mining port in the world. Handmade canoes were brought over from 12 Pacific nations for a day blockade, which prevented 10 ships from leaving and arriving. They came with a simple message that they were not drowning but fighting for their homelands. For more information about what you can do outside of recycling and energy efficient light bulbs, check out 350.org who are conducting some really progressive interventions like divesting coal funding banks, lobbying the government, etc. The Climate Warriors thanked the Australian community for their solidarity and on that note, 
as prescribed by the Tongan saying, the treasure of Tonga is in saying thank you. Thank you.